Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Muy buenas tardes, todos son muy bienvenidos. This is our uh, right-sizing uh, community engagement session that will be translated in Spanish this evening. Esto es una sesión de right-sizing y lo vamos a traducir en español para todos los que necesiten el idioma. And I'd like to give a special thank you to Cassandra Davis for being with us tonight to translate uh, this program. It's an honor for me um, to support the community. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to introduce a few other people here with us. Um, Mr. Chris Keckler is our um, Educational and Accountability Director. Uh, estamos este presentando al señor Chris Cracker. Um, we also have our school board president, Ms. Yolanda Adams. Es la presidenta, uh, la señora Yolanda. As well as a team from Davis Demographic that will be uh, conducting this uh, major portion of this presentation. Y tenemos al, al, al team Davis. Mm -hmm. um, a couple items before we get started. Um, first off, I want to share the goal for this evening. Algunos eh, temas que van a, va a tomar uh, antes de empezar esta tarde. There are really uh, three goals. The first one is to present data regarding enrollment trends and our building capacity. La primera es el goal del programa uh, Davis Company, la compañía de Davis. We also will have an opportunity for feedback using an online survey. De igual manera, agradecer a todo lo que es programa online de todo el servicio que están proveyendo en estos momentos. Questions. Questions related to right sizing. Yep. Es acerca de eh, preguntas que van a, vamos a llevar a cabo acerca de este programa. And then, the, how that data will be used. So, this evening, we're going to go over the enrollment data will have the feedback, and the way that information will be used then is to help inform the scenarios that we are developing regarding right-sizing. Can you go for it? I'll keep on going. Um, a little background about the reason why we have to uh, discuss right-sizing. District enrollment peaked at 23,000 students in 2012. Since that time, due to decreasing birth rates, our enrollment uh, figures in September were just under 19,000. That's an average, that's a loss of about 4,000 students in 10 years, and we've been averaging about 325 students decrease every year, mainly due to declining birth rates. This leaves the district with several choices. So state funding is really based on per pupil, um, the number of pupils that are, number of students that are in a, in a district. And the state allocates about $11,000 for each student, uh, taxing authority to the district. So as enrollment declines, the amount of money that can be used for operation declines as well. Which leaves us with a choice as far as, as we lose revenue, and as revenue goes down, we have a choice of either cutting programs or reducing locations. In a school district such as ours, about 80% of our budget goes to salary and benefits. Am I doing okay, or just keep on going? Go far, please. Okay, um, so about 80% is uh, salary and benefits. Um, as superintendent, it's my duty to make sure that we are uh, having the best educational program available for our students. By consolidating the locations where we do have our, our services, we're able to maintain those services and not have to reduce them. So that is why we are engaging in right-sizing. Um, really, it's a choice between programs or location, and I would much rather have educational programs to make sure all of our students are getting the best quality education possible. So I'm sorry if I didn't introduce myself in the beginning. Did I introduce myself? I'm forgetting. I, thank you. I'm sorry. 
Um, I wanted to be conscious for the, to, so that we could do the translation and just kind of, I'm overthinking things, <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, but that is why we are engaging in the right-sizing um, of the school district. We won't have scenarios to share tonight. As I said, we're having several meetings like this across the district to gather your feedback, feedback from the community. We also had a community um, committee of about 35 people that met in June. They've been meeting since June. Their feedback will be used as well. Um, and then we'll be presenting scenarios to the school board. Our goal is to do that uh, November 14th. Um, that's, we'd have the scenarios available. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Richards uh, from Davis uh, Demographics, who's assisting us with our work. Oh, if I, um, I also forgot to mention, uh, do you want to go over that when questions are? Oh, I can do that. Well, good evening. My name is Lance Richards, and I am with uh, Davis MGT. Muy buenas tardes. Uh, soy el señor Richard Lenz. And uh, joining me tonight are Danny Dominguez and Monica Horner. Marcy Horner. Did I say Monica? Monica is one of my coworkers. I, now, how are we going to transcribe all that? <laughs> Tenemos <laughs> a la señorita Marcy Horner en el señor Daniel Dominguez. So uh, again, we appreciate you coming out for the for our event this evening. I know that you have many other places you can be, and we appreciate you took time to be with us this evening. Um, se le aprecia mucho los que están presentes aquí. Podrían estar en otro lado, pero vienen acá um, a compartir este este evento. So a few housekeeping measures. Esta es la agenda que vamos a empezar. Um, well, just a, a quick outline here. Um, we're going to talk about, as you can see through here, we have about seven items that we wish to cover. Para empezar, son siete temas que que se da se dará hablar. And and I, if you would please, if you can hold your question till the end, we're going to try to work our way through all the data um, and 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 through our community questions, and you'll have opportunities for responses within the questions. And many of your questions will be answered as we make, I'm, I'm confident that many of your questions will be answered as we make our way through this process. Eh, al final de todo, vamos a tener un tiempo para que ustedes puedan hacer sus preguntas, eh, alguna preguntas que ustedes tengan para que ellos les pueda responder. All right. So just a little bit of background on how we do what we do. It kind of the, uh, the magic ingredients that go into the pie, if you will. A continuación estaremos hablando acerca de todo lo que es este, el conjunto de datas. And so, as you can see here, we have current, oh, sorry, I got to press the right button. We have current historic student data. So, what we do is, is we look at birth factors, mobility factors, and student yield factors to bring down and create student forecasts. A continuación, como ustedes verán, tenemos lo que es datos de los estudiantes actuales e históricos. Tenemos también todo lo que son factores de nacimiento, factores de movilidad también, eh, factores de rendimiento y al final el resultado que van a ser lo que es las predicciones de los estudiantes. So, starting with birth factors, those are your birth rates that we mentioned before. Vamos a empezar primeramente con todo lo que son factores de nacimiento. Mobility factors are those kids in and out of your district and school zones. Estos son todo lo que son factores de movilidad. And student yield factors, let me back up. The, the mobility factors deal with your existing housing stock, the existing homes, the existing apartments that are within your district. Mobili the mobili mobility factors. Could you I'm sorry, could you repeat again, please? Yes. Uh, so mo the mobility factors, the numbers that we generate for mobility work with your existing housing stock, your existing homes and existing apartments that are already here. Okay, eh, en todo lo que es este, en esta, en esta parte de factores de movilidad, eh, está incluyendo todo lo que es eh, las casas existentes, los estudiantes que están aquí en, la, en, esta, en esta ciudad. And then your student yield factors, that's a fancy way of saying new development. So those are going to be the new homes and the new apartments that come on and how many students we draw out of those new developments. 
en lo que es este factor de rendimiento estudiantil serían todo lo que es uh, las nuevas casas, los nuevos estudiantes en esta zona. All right. So, starting with birth factors, birth rates. If you will note, these are the primary zip codes for the Kenosha School District. Como pueden ver ahí, todo es lo que es este factor de natalidad y participación del mercado que dice la parte de arriba y están de acuerdo a, a los, este, a los códigos, códigos postales. And the, the 12 to 17 represents the year they were born and the year that they would enter your kindergarten. En cuanto al 2012 al 2017 son aquellos que nacieron y están en el kindergarten. And what we're seeing is a declining birth rate in the majority of your, of these areas. Which one? State government. I'm sure that's census data based for, on the Wisconsin. And, but the, there's also, since they also, I, I can't, right, right, right. But that, that becomes the mobility. I, would, I know in Indiana, I was on the health board, and so each county then had to report live births back up to the state. So the state then had a database of birth, births by county based on, uh, based on that reporting. That was a good question. So on the right-hand side, you have a historical correlation of birth versus kindergarten class. And by this, we mean 1,614 children were born 1422 showed up five years later for kindergarten. En el siguiente, en el siguiente gráfico está todo lo que es la correlación histórica de natalidad versus clases de jardín de infantes. And so that's a capture rate of 88.1%. So as, as you track this across, you've got 13 to 18 on all these cases. You do see a dip here for COVID, and then you see that rebound back into the 80s uh, post-COVID. Go for it. Yeah. Can you go you, you okay? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I guess the, the takeaway for translation is, is that you've generally ran in the 80s, and you could probably, these outliers of COVID, you can say that your capture rate is generally in the upper 80s for those kindergarten students. All right, so mobility factors. Now, this is the second component in terms of our, of our calculations. Estos son los factores de, de movilidad del año escolar del 2019 al 2022. And so what you see is this does address your move-ins and outs, your chart and you, to both charter and private school movement, shifts and shifts in existing housing patterns. Again, we're, le we're dealing with your existing housing patterns, kids in and kids out. Okay. Uh, determinado a partir de los cuatro años de, de datos históricos mapeados de estudiantes, realiza un seguimiento del porcentaje de ganancia o pérdida para cada nivel de grado a medida que los estudiantes avancen en los grados. Otro es que son los factores que se apliquen en el área de asistencia primaria. Hay otro que dice que aborda las mudanzas de entrada y salida, el movimiento de escuelas, de escuelas charters y privadas, los cambios en los patrones de viviendas existentes y el desgaste en los grados superiores. And so, in looking at this, The red kind of indicates a decline, the blue is even, and the green is a slight growth. All right, of note, I want to note your 11 to 12 here, because this is a very positive indicator for your district. Rarely do we see a complete green in that 11 to 12th grade, 
range. And the reason for that is, is credit recovery. Students returning to get those high school diplomas, returning, returning to get those credits, and those folks, those students factor into that last year. So that's an area of positive and, and should be considered a great area of strength for your district. Okay. Student yield factors. Now these go to your new residential developments, homes and apartments. Estos son los factores de rendimiento estudiantil. A uh, los factores de rendimiento estudiantil, esto ayudan a determinar el número previsto de estudiantes para nuevos desarrollos residenciales, para viviendas unifamiliares, independientes. Esto significa que Kenosha Unify podría esperar ganar 56 estudiantes por cada 100 nuevas viviendas unifamiliares independientes construidas. And so, in looking at homes, single family homes, you have a yield factor of 0.558, basically 0.6. And what that means is, is that you would expect to gain 56 students for every 100 new homes that are built, or basically five students, almost six students for every 10 homes that are built. Okay, and then on the apartment side, you're going to gain about two students uh, for the apartment units that come online. So what, what we see in many areas is a lot of apartments coming online, especially in the, in the downtown areas, and many of those are studio and one-bedroom apartments, and to be honest, those don't, don't generate a lot of students in general. And if they do, the students that come in may stay a year and move on because they want uh, larger housing. This is actually a, a fairly strong number for housing development. In many cases, we see as low as three and four in new development in terms of student generation, and the apartment number can be also be lower. So these are your residential developments. So um, Marcy, not Monica, Marcy and one of our coworkers actually drove your district to map out the new residential developments. And you can see here, based on the color coding, where like the red is apartments, blue is multifamily attached, say duplexes, that sort of thing, and then you've got single family detached um, listed. And so you can see basically down, I guess that's 104th Street, there's some new development and that sort of thing. It's just kind of interesting to see where the growth is. En esto están hablando sobre lo que es desarrollo residenciales y se están realizando un seguimiento de 12 nuevos desarrollos residenciales en todo el distrito. En la previsión se incluyen 604 un nuevas unidades residenciales. All right, and so these are the units by elementary zone. And, and I, I do need to qualify this. We're going to be talking a lot about at elementary attendance zones this evening, so that, because that's kind of the breakdown for how we quantified uh, the forecast. So in this case, not all elementary's got growth, and you can see Whittier got 30 or 172 units, 32 percent. Uh, Stoker's over here at 18 uh, percent. Brass, I believe that's 11 percent for them. So you can just see the breakdown of new units. En esto son las unidades por las zonas primarias. Aquí en a continuación van a empezar a va a empezar a hablar de todas las escuelas elementales. Eh, están organizadas de acuerdo a un cierto porcentaje, de acuerdo a las, a las unidades también. All right, student density. I think this one's a fun one from a, just a data nerd standpoint of the, the, the density of students in, in, in a certain, and you would expect the downtown area to have, and the, more, the core to have more students, uh, kind of a, a hot spot here. And then as you can see out and around Summers and in the, in the, into the south, West Quadrant, far, far less density of students. Esto habla sobre la densidad estudiantil de enero del 2023. Lo que ven ustedes, las áreas amarillas indican una mayor concentración de población estudiantil, mientras que las áreas sombradas en azul tienen menos estudiantes. And now, there will be a test on this afterwards, so hopefully you've prepared. 
there, there's a lot of important information in this, in this sheet. And so, um, in terms of translation, do you want me to just run through it and then maybe you yeah. come back and interpret? Okay, let's try that. All right, so there's a lot going on here, but it's, there's a lot of information that can be culled from this. So if you, as you look at your schools, and you can see these are the number of students living in the, atten in, in the attendance area. So in, at uh, McKinley here, there are 400 students that live in the attendance area for McKinley. But as you draw across, you'll see that 100, only 168 of those students actually go to McKinley. As you, as you, so 15 of those are in, in the programs there at Epsilon. Uh, as you go across, 10 of them, those are going to Roosevelt. So you can see where all of the kids land based on where their residence is and where the very differing schools are. So if you go down to say Whittier, 418, a significant number of those, 311, actually go to Whittier. But as you come across, 15 are at Roosevelt, 10 are at um, Jeffrey and so forth. I will say that um, an area of strength for your district, something that should be applauded and showcased is the amount of choice that's allowed within your district because I've traveled the nation uh, working in schools in the last 18 months and that just isn't something that I see regularly in other districts and certainly not at this level. So it's kind of interesting to see, you know, all of the choices that can be made for your parents in terms of going forward, in terms of the other specialty programs as well. But you can also see the choices that parents are making in terms of where students are attending. And down at the bottom, you've got out of district students, and that gives you a total as you run across the bottom. You wanna take a crack at that? It, yes, in some schools that is the case. Do you want to keep going? Okay. All right. So, again, there's a lot of information here we'll, um, that you, we can share. We'll also have this here for the middle schools. And kind of to the, to the woman's uh, comments here to the front, there are a lot of choices that have been made. So you've got Lance Middle, uh, my personal favorite school in terms of school name here for you guys. Uh, 927 residential students, 712 uh, attend that actually live within the residence and the other choices that are made by parents and folks going forward. Um, Washington Middle, 585, 363 attend Washington out of that residence area. And so you, again, uh, Mahone, uh, Lincoln, and Bullen all have uh, similar uh, breakdowns in terms of choices. Pardon? It's over here. So the uh, good point, though. So these are the boundary schools. The residents are broken down into the boundary schools, and then the specialty programs are listed off to the right. So again, for high schools, um, your boundary schools are here. Uh, number of students uh, in the 9 through 12 grades living in that area. And then the program, especially programs off to the right. But uh, let's see, Bradford, 1287 of the 2275 uh, elect to go to their home school. Utilization analysis. Now this is, so you've got school capacity enrollment, but then you also have utilization. Utilization is the effective use of space in a given building. Esto es uh, el análisis de utilización. Eh, la capacidad escolar y la matrícula deben estar alineadas para una gestión eficaz de las instalaciones escolares. Las escuelas con un uso ineficiente del espacio están subutilizadas. Cuando la capacidad excede en las inscripciones, 
los costos operativos son más altos de lo necesario. So, it's important to note that 100% is not the, um, is not the goal of utilization. That we're looking at this 80 to 95% range in, in order to have um, adequate use of a facility. And the reason for that is, is that kids aren't broken down into that 18 to 20 kid increment. So you may have a year where, you may have a school where it's a four section or four track school, which means that you've got four kindergartens, four first grades, four second grades, four third and fourth, forward. But one year you may have a bumper crop and have an extra kindergarten class, but maybe only three third grade classes. So they're not all, bro and then you may have an extra set of move-ins. So one class, one set of classes is at 27, the other set of classes is at 18. And so you're, you can't drive that utilization to 100% because it just doesn't work that way. Also, in your high schools, your AP classes, your labs, and some of your tech and CT and all those things are going to have varying numbers in enrollment, but your orchestra and your band and some of those other areas may have 80 kids in a space. And so that percentage of utilization, that target, allows for the bumper groups and the, dis and the differing levels of class sizes at the high school levels, at secondary and high school, or middle school and high school levels. It is, it is the, I'm sorry, I didn't, hadn't said it yet, but it's, it's basically, um, it's, I, don't know, I thought it was up there. Well, excuse me, I'm sorry. It, it's a, it originated from a facility standpoint, so square footage of classrooms, not of the whole building. You know, we don't include offices or closets or anything. So it's the square footage of that, but then we then did a buffer reduction. So of 8% at the elementaries and 5% at the secondaries. For, for some of those scenarios. So again, it's not a goal of maxing out these locations, but getting them to a nice point where it's the mixture of efficient use and enough students to help support the resources. Yeah, yeah, it's classroom it, size. Uh, yep. Yeah, it's basically, yeah. if you had 10 classrooms and you decided that the classroom ratio is gonna be 20 to one, now you got a 200 kid building. Yeah, but, but we factor in desks, chairs, so it's, it's right. not just an empty room. We, we build in resources, cabinets, things like that. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's square footage available in the classrooms. It, it boils down to classrooms, number of kids in classrooms in terms of utilization. And, and not all classrooms are the same size, so facilities went and did an audit of classrooms, square footage pertinent to that size with other supplies within in the room. Oh, so, uh, go ahead. La siguiente clave uh, muestra las tasas de utilización de los edificios codificados por colores para identificar las mejores prácticas para el uso de los edificios. So, again, the, so we've got this color coded, so when we come over to the, other, to the next slide, you'll see that the green is that adequate space, it's that target, pink goes to inefficient, red goes to inadequate because you're overcrowded. It's an, uh, so, in an in a overcrowded building, what you run into is crowded hallways and, and cafeterias that can't get everyone seated or get through a lunchroom in, amount, in a, an appropriate amount of time. And in, in, on the other end of that spe space, you have inefficient use of space where you may be using rooms for storage or, or you're allowing just a tutor to have a, their own classroom because there's space and why not? So both of these present problems operationally for your school district. All right, so here's your utilization analysis. As you look at this, we've got a lot, you know, let's be all honest with one another, we've got a lot of pink on the screen. And so as you look at your larger map to the side, you can see the utilization in terms of color codings. Um, as you just glance down through the chart here, uh, Pleasant Prairie is at 81, I think this is uh, Nash is at 87, uh, Strange is at 81, Roosevelt, Roosevelt 105, Jefferson's at 103. One thing we do need to note about Jefferson is their total capacity is only 207 students. So a, a few students one way or another can, can uh, vastly uh, impact their percentage of utilization. Okay. And then on to the height, the middle, I'm sorry, middle schools, you can see uh, the color coding as well. Of course, a larger foot, footprint boundary wise, 
Um, numbers not quite so dramatic at Bullen and Lance and Mahomes here, but you can see with Lincoln and Washington, we're down into the 40s. Likewise for the high schools, you've got Bradford and Trimper in the 70s and Indian Trail at uh, 83. And again, these are going to be your, your boundary schools uh, uh, in terms of their uh, residence and capacity, or in terms of their in enrollment and capacity. All right, so this is going to be another one where there's quite a bit going on. If I haven't said this before, um, what we're doing, and you know, we're not playing checkers. We're playing chess. There's a lot of moving parts here. There are a lot of considerations, and the forecasted resident of resident students is a part of that process. Esto es todo lo que es este, los estudiantes residentes previstos. En la parte de arriba, como dice, los residentes previstos y basados en donde se encuentra la dirección del hogar dentro del distrito. La parte de abajo indica que los pronósticos que uh, se generaron, utilizaron los datos en el censo del, del, del mes de enero del 2023 como so, base de datos. So in this one, as we spoke earlier, we talked about impact of housing projects, okay? So that is, think of your resident students as a pie. So what's baked into your pie now is impact of housing projects. So new residents, new, new, on, new units coming online are baked into this, into this formula. Likewise, we talked about impact of mobility and mobility deals with your current housing stock and the choices parents make in terms of moving in and moving out of not only the homes in your district, but also the schools and the facilities and the programs and the varying offerings in your, in your district. And, and baked into that would be new residents, folks moving into your community. So if you take away nothing else on this screen, if nothing else in looking at this, kind of to your point earlier, ma'am, about the number of students choosing to enroll within the school, you're looking here in, in kindergarten in 2023, 1264 enrolled. If you come down to here, 1657 are going to go out the door. So if, as you run the line back, you can see the numbers are pretty good for your secondary, your high school into eighth grade. But as you move on back, 13. Kind of, and again, uh, kind of back to the kind of the birth rate discussion earlier, it's not a dramatic fall off a cliff, but it is a general trend in, in, in the wrong direction. And kind, of, and, and, and kind of back to birth rates for a moment, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. And we, again, we see that in a number of places where we work. In large part, number one, you don't see the large families you used to see when, we, when I was a kid. We had a lot, of, a lot of larger families. Now, if you saw somebody with three kids, you'd go, oh my, that, that's kind of out of the ordinary. Also, folks are delaying births. So, they're, you know, it, when I, I was going to date myself here, but, you know, we had our kids by the time we were in our mid-20s, late-20s, the family we were going to have. My own children are not having their kids until their late-20s, early-30s. And so delayed birth also impacts the choices or the, the enrollments that you might see. But this is a general trend that we see everywhere, not just Kenosha. So the only way you overcome the declining birth rates or the trends down is through folks coming in. It's new development, it's folks moving into your community so you can try to offset or backfill that declining birth rate, offset some of that negative mo mobility if those choices come into play. So again, if, as you're looking at these numbers, 1264 in the door, 1657 out the door. And, and that's kind of the general trend that you might see. All right, so forecasted resident students PK-5. Kind of going back to our, just our general model, we've got a current year and you've got your trend line down. And as your superintendent shared earlier, that's kind of been your trend line for the last decade, plus or minus 300 to 350 students a year moving forward. And if you quanti let's quantify that 350, that's basically an elementary school. It's a small, that's a small elementary school. That, that doesn't come back, that is gone in the, in the coming year. 
All right, uh, students six through eight, 4,036. 4, Again, you can see kind of as you go across. And then uh, students nine through 12, 61, 69, and going across. Now, one comment I would make about forecasting, and I, and I should have made, I meant to make this back in our earlier one. When you're looking at forecasts, we can be very confident in our forecast for the next three to five years, much like a weather forecast, the local weather forecast, uh, when you're watching television or the, the local news. You get a little farther out and then you gotta kinda monitor the situation. So it is important that we update our resident, our forecast, you know, each year, so that, you know, again, that three-day forecast becomes another three-day forecast, becomes another three-day forecast as we move forward. So this is your resident student projected net change. And in what, when we do our study groups, our study areas, we chunk out basically each of these zones to include roughly 100 students in these segments. And so in these segments, what you can see is roughly 100 kids in each segment and the forecast for each of these segments going forward. So basically in red, that's a 15 to 30 student loss over time uh, in the next five years. Uh, white is no change. Uh, let's see, what is that? What did we said that color was? Salmon? That was not in my Crayola box. Salmon is basically one to 15 student loss and then you see growth on the other side of that with blue. Student residente cambio neto proyectado para el año escolar 2022 a 2027. Las áreas de estudio con pérdidas significativas son de color rojo más oscuro, mientras que aquellas con pérdidas menores son de color un rojo claro. El blanco indica que no hay cambios netos en el área de estudios. Las áreas de estudio con crecimiento significativo son de color azul más oscuro, mientras que aquellas con crecimiento menor son de color azul uh, más claro, celeste. So, I'm going to quickly go through these next set of slides, and these, these are in your packet as well. Uh, these are shared with you so you can kind of see the individual schools, and you can see what their capacities are, and kind of what their trend lines are in terms of uh, available um, uh, seats for students. One caveat, Epsilon and it's, I believe Vernon both have additional programs in the building. So when you see their charts, they're not exactly accurate because there are other programs within those two facilities. But for the other schools, such as Bose and Brass, as we move our way through, you can see that you know, capacity is 437, they're at 351, and this is their general trend line. Um, the orange is your current year. That these are the resident or the boundary yeah. enrollments as, as if all of the kids that are of that age group went to those schools. So, so and that's why we're able, we forecast out for the boundary areas, but you do also have the charts for the enrollment. The utilization is based on the actual enrollment that's been in there. But now as we, few, it, 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 it does. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's re and those are reflective of this choice. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. And we're we're. Yeah. That's why some will be above the red line, but part of that is because neighborhoods or population shifts move, and if all of those families, because everybody has a right to their boundary school, and so if if everybody chose that option, there are some of these where you'll see them for a couple of years above the red line, which is a concerning uh, liability. So, yep. Good question. All right, so Brass, I'm just gonna go through these very quickly. Um, Forest Park, Frank, Grant. Again, this is the resident students in, in their attendance zones. Elementary, McKinley, Nash. And then we'll also have these as we make our way through, 552 here, um, as we make our way through to the uh, middle schools. Again, Vernon has an additional program. Bullen Middle, 
Lance Middle, Lincoln Middle, Mahone, Bradford, Indian Trail, and Trimper, I believe that's all right. So this, the facility condition page here is intended to give you a snapshot of the facility conditions for each of those buildings based on the assessment, the columns that you see. Estas son las condiciones de todo eh, dentro de las escuelas. Ahí lo van a ver dentro de los tres colores. Eh, lo que es, están bien, el otro, los amarillos, como que está dentro del rango normal y el rojo que está realmente muy, muy pobre. And so, of interest to me, I think, is just kind of as you run down through this first column, you've got 1929, 1924, 1924. So you've got several buildings that, you know, that at least a core portion of that facility was built into the 20s. Um, and as you make your way across, um, you can kind of see where the district's eye would be in terms of deferred maintenance on these facilities. And again, similarly here with the middle schools and high schools, um, as you go forward. Interestingly, Washington, you know, their roots are 1920. 